This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Good morning. In today's headlines, Chinese leader Xi Jinping and President Vladimir Putin engage in a second day of talks in Moscow. We speak to a retired Marine colonel for his take on the meeting and what it means for the rest of the world. Americans will soon have more insight into the origins of the COVID-19 virus. President Biden signs a bill declassifying government intelligence on the matter. Witness testimony is wrapping up in the Manhattan DA's investigation of former President Trump. We take a look at protests on the streets of New York. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is sounding a warning against the Biden administration's digital currency plans. He says it's about surveilling and controlling Americans, and he's proposing a bill in Florida against it. And a retired Navy SEAL who published a book to help everyone bring out the leader in themselves. He shares some valuable lessons he's learned. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning. I'm Evelyn Lee. Today is Tuesday, March 21st, and we have a lot to get to this morning. We're starting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. He's having his second day of talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow today. China is portraying itself as a broker of peace and calling for a ceasefire. But the U.S. says the visit is diplomatic cover for war. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg reports. The two leaders called each other dear friends and exchanged compliments before starting their four-and-a-half-hour talk on Monday. They touted the close ties between China and Russia and their shared strategic visions. Talks were followed by a dinner banquet. Moscow wants to strengthen relations and discuss the war in Ukraine. Beijing frames the trip as a journey of friendship, cooperation and peace. But U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken doesn't buy into the alleged agenda of peace as the reason for the visit. China's 12-point peace proposal is being interpreted by many Western countries as a ploy to buy Russian forces more time to regroup and solidify their positions. Blinken warned allied countries not to be fooled by any tactical move by Russia supported by China to freeze the war on its own terms. Ceasefire now, without a durable solution, would allow President Putin to rest and refit his troops and then restart the war at a time more advantageous to Russia. Blinken cautioned that a ceasefire that doesn't require removing Russian forces from Ukraine is effectively supporting ratification of Russian conquest. He says the timing of Xi's visit suggests China feels no responsibility to hold Russia accountable for wartime atrocities. The U.S. is watching China closely for any sign of them providing military aid to Russia. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Joining me now to talk about this visit is retired Marine Colonel Grant Newsham. He's also currently an Epoch Times contributor and senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy. Good morning, Grant. Good morning. Glad to be here. Good to have you. Now, what do you think she is doing in Moscow right now? Well, I think Secretary of State Blinken has accurately characterized it. Uh, There's nothing good that's going to come out of this, at least for the free world. Uh, She is uh, demonstrating his really thoroughgoing support for the Russians and what they're doing in Ukraine. Uh, Any suggestion of a peace deal is really a charade. Uh, But consider that Putin has just been indicted by the International Criminal Court. It's widely known the atrocities being committed in Ukraine, not to mention a UN Security Council member attacking another independent state to take it over, something we thought the world was long long done with. And she is going ahead with this meeting and listen to the language that you hear there. Uh, This is a a pretty clear statement of uh, support for Russia and alignment of strategic interests. Right, and we just heard that the U.S. is watching whether China will send military aid to Russia. How likely do you think that is? I think it's very likely. In fact, I think it's already happening. Uh, It was reported publicly a couple of weeks ago that Chinese ammunition has been found uh, on the battlefields in Ukraine. Uh, Also, it's been reported a long time ago that drone parts and um, assistance with uh, deactivating uh, Ukrainian drones uh, has been provided covert surreptitious uh, Chinese uh, transport flights uh, with transponders turned off. Uh, Those have been reported for some months now. 
Uh, so military equipment does seem to be getting in. Uh, also, uh, North Koreans uh, have been providing uh, military hardware to the Russians. And I'll bet that there's an agreement on China's part, one, that North Korea can do it and that North Korean stocks will be replenished uh, with Chinese ones. Uh, really, it's just a question of how uh, overt China is going to be with this uh, provision of uh, weaponry and also the scale of it. Um, and one has to presume that the Americans know more than they are publicly letting on. Uh, it's been couched as, well, China's considering it, um, but one should uh, regard that with a degree of skepticism. Mm, absolutely. Now, how do you think, how does China benefit from an alliance with Russia? Well, there's a couple things. One is that uh, by keeping this war going, by providing support uh, to Russia, uh, this distracts all sorts of American attention and free world attention from Asia, and specifically Taiwan. So just think about it. Look, consider the distraction that this has been. Uh, so it's in China's interest to have, have that happen. Also, it's in China's interest to have a weakened Russia. Uh, yes, their strategic uh, interest align in, uh, in the sense that both of them hate the United States, want to destroy it or dominate it. And with America out of the way, uh, China and Russia pretty much have a free run. Um, so a weakened Russia uh, is actually to China's benefit because when the time comes, uh, China is going to demand and get Russian help and uh, support for, uh, say, an attack on Taiwan for other aggressive Chinese moves in Asia. Now, Chinese diplomats have scrupulously supported uh, the Russians from the start of the, the Ukraine invasion. Uh, so there's also another aspect, and that is that uh, there's large parts of the Russian Far East that China believes were stolen from it in the 19th and 18th centuries. And when the time comes, China intends to get that back. Uh, they'll do it perhaps uh, salami slicing, uh, but make no mistake, uh, there's no great love between the two countries. And when the time comes, uh, China is going to uh, repay Russia for taking their territory. Uh, but for now, they do have an alignment of interests. And China's effectively telling the rest of the world, look, we don't care. Uh, what are you going to do? And that it does seem to be the attitude it has towards uh, the, the rest of the world and this administration. Mm, I think that's a very interesting point also for China to uh, that a weakened Russia would be beneficial to them. And I want to touch on what happened earlier this month as well before we go really quick. So China mediated, mediated a deal that restored Saudi Arabia and Iran relations. Now, why do you think are we seeing China involving itself in these conflicts now? Uh, well, some immediate benefits are China gets a lot of cheap oil uh, locked up for a long time. Additionally, it has the prospects of Saudi Arabia and Iran using the Chinese currency. And that means they're not using American dollars. And that works to China's advantage because it wants to get away from this dependence uh, on the U.S. dollar. Uh, additionally, it makes America look ridiculous. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been America's uh, key ally in the, the area. We are thought to be the most influential uh, country. Now China just slips in and cuts a deal between Iran uh, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, plus, uh, China has been a big supporter of Iran. And what you're seeing is an, an alliance of sorts between countries like Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, Russia, North Korea. Uh, one sees the pattern there. Uh, so it's all a part of gradually expanding your presence, your influence. Uh, throughout the globe. And once again, the, the psychological blow to the United States of uh, sort of being looked, ir being perceived and seen as irrelevant or not as relevant uh, in an area that was America's turf. Uh, that's uh, one more plus mark in the sort of the dominate America column. There's a ways to go, uh, but China likes what it's seeing. Very interesting and lots of things to be cautious about. So thank you so much, Grant Nushin. I appreciate it. Sure, thanks very much. Now, in related news, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kyiv. The Japanese Prime Minister vo will voice support and solidarity with Ukraine following the invasion by Russian forces more than a year ago. Japan will host a G7 summit in Hiroshima in May. Kishida says the summit should demonstrate a strong will to uphold international order and the rule of law in response to the Ukraine war. Americans will soon be able to see intelligence regarding the origins of the COVID-19 virus. President Biden signed a bill that declassifies the information yesterday. 
Here's the story. President Biden on Monday signed the COVID-19 Origin Act of 2023. It's a bill that mandates the declassification of COVID origin-related intelligence. Here's what the White House said about the bill earlier this month. The first few months of the president's administration, he uh, he uh, he came into office. He directed the intelligence community to de declassify information uh, assessing or, uh, COVID origins and to make that report uh, public to, uh, to to Americans people, to the American people, because we know and he understands how important it is to get to the bottom of COVID oranges. We will, origins. We will continue to use every tool to figure out what happened here uh, while also protecting uh, classified information. Biden said in a statement Monday, quote, we need to get to the bottom of COVID-19's origins to help ensure we can better prevent future pandemics. My administration will continue to review all classified information related to COVID-19's origins, including potential links to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Both the House and Senate unanimously passed the bill earlier this month. Republican Senators Josh Hawley and Mike Braun introduced the bill. Here's Hawley speaking to Fox News on March 1st. Listen, the American people, it, it's past time. Let's yeah. show them what the government has. Let everybody see for themselves. Let everybody read it. At the center of contention is the Wuhan Institute of Virology. U.S. health agencies were found to have funneled federal money to the lab via a New York nonprofit, EcoHealth Alliance. Experts say that some of this funding aided gain-of-function research at the Wuhan lab. The debate over virus origins came back to the surface again recently. This is after the Energy Department concluded that a lab leak is the most likely source of the pandemic. The FBI also reached the same conclusion. Senator Josh Hawley wants to put an end to China's so-called sweetheart trade status. The senator is introducing a bill today that would cancel the country's most favored nation status within two years. The proposal would also allow higher tariffs on Chinese imports. Hawley says China's privileged trade status has played a role in the loss of nearly 4 million good manufacturing jobs. He says the lost jobs in some communities have resulted in fewer people getting married, as well as more addiction, divorce and suicide. The senator says policies that weaken working men and women in America and make the CCP rich must be repealed. Now on to the Manhattan DA's investigation into former President Trump. Our reporter Jason Perry is on location outside the courthouse in Manhattan. Jason, what's it like down there right now? Good morning. I hope you guys are doing well. I'm here right outside of the courthouse in Manhattan. And as you can see, barricades have been put up around the courthouse. And I've seen several NYPD officers patrolling the area. It appears the Manhattan District Attorney's Office is now closing in on a decision whether or not to indict former President Donald Trump. The reason would be for an alleged hush money payment made in 2016 to pornographic actress Stormy Daniels. Trump denies those allegations. Trump has called for people to protest, while others, such as House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, has asked people not to protest. So what will happen today? A source close to the Trump legal team told CNN that if Trump is indicted, they do not expect any arrest or appearance in court to happen before next week. And Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg will have some explaining to do. The House Judiciary Committee um, on Monday ordered Bragg to testify. The committee told Bragg that his apparent decision to pursue criminal charges where federal authorities declined to do so requires oversight. And they also asked for a number of documents related to the case. Trump is leading in many of the polls to become the next president of the United States. So some people are calling this investigation politically motivated. Well, that's all we have for now. Back to you in the studio. Thank you for that update, Jason. Attorney Robert Costello testified before grand jurors in the case yesterday. Costello was a former legal advisor to ex-Trump lawyer Michael Cohen. He says Cohen can't be trusted. He had in hand over 300 business records in the form of emails that he says can show that. Here's what Costello had to say yesterday about, had to say about Cohen's credibility after his testimony yesterday. The only thing I'm doing is trying to tell the truth to the grand jurors, because I read all these lies in the, in the media that are being promoted by one side. If you see the full picture, you know, listen, if they want to go after Donald Trump and they have solid evidence, so be it. But Michael Cohn is far from solid evidence. This guy, by any prosecutor's standard, and I used to be deputy chief of the criminal division in the Southern District of New York, I wouldn't have touched a guy like Michael Cohn, especially if he's a convicted perjurer. 
not to mention, as I said, the 50 to 100 lies he told us that are in those 330 emails. Costello says out of 321 emails, only six were shown to the grand jury for review and that they were cherry picked and taken out of context. He says he was surprised that none of the jurors asked for the complete records that he brought in. Costello says when Cohen was his client, he was in a desperate state and was looking for a way out and that Cohen told him at least 20 times he would do anything to stay out of jail. Now that Cohen has served time, Costello believes he's out for revenge. Costello testified that Cohen told him the payments to Stormy Daniels were made without Trump's knowledge and that Cohen said he took out a loan to get the money. And protesters gathered yesterday in New York outside the courthouse where prosecutors are wrapping up their investigation. It appears the grand jury in the case is hearing from its final witnesses. Members of the New York Young Republican Club protested yesterday. Gavin Wax, the president of the club, says he doesn't want to be there if Trump is arrested. He advised others to protest peacefully and to stay away from the court if it happens. Whatever it actually happens, it'll probably be a little bit of a zoo, so I would stay away. The American people realize that this is a witch hunt, and um, these charges have been in circulation since 2018. The fabric of our constitutional republic is more important than our political differences. These people don't care. They'll go after Trump. They'll arrest Trump because they want to stop him from restoring our country to what it was over the last number of years. We need a DA who's going to focus on doing the job and not weaponizing his office to pursue political persecutions that are neither wanted nor nor uh, warranted. Coming up, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says federal digital currency will see a no welcome sign in Florida, and he's introduced a bill to make that happen. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Shen Yun, coming to Lincoln Center, April 6th to the 16th. Buy tickets now at ShenYun.com. This is Stephen K. Bannon. I urge you to protect your savings from inflation by diversifying into a physical gold IRA from Birch Gold Group. Simply text the word NTD to 989898 and you'll get a free info kit on gold IRAs explaining everything. I am blind, but I cannot see. Mm -hmm. I know this road is there for me. If I'm real. Welcome back. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is calling out President Joe Biden on digital currency. He accuses the administration of weaponizing money and is proposing a bill to combat that for Floridians. Entity's Daniel Monahan brings us more. President Biden issued an executive order last year which calls for exploring the creation of a digital currency. It would be directly controlled and issued to consumers by the federal government. DeSantis says such a currency would provide the government with a direct view of all consumer activity. Any way they can get into society uh, to exercise their agenda, they will do it. So what the central bank digital currency is all about is surveilling Americans and controlling behavior of Americans. The Florida governor says society has witnessed the consequences of such control in other parts of the world. Look at no further than China to see the impacts of centralized digital currency. The People's Bank of China uses its central bank to monitor citizen behavior, allowing for the surveillance of spending habits and to cut off access to goods and services. The proposal by DeSantis would prohibit the use of a federal digital currency in Florida. The White House says a digital dollar would improve efficiency and could promote financial inclusion and equity. Meanwhile, DeSantis also criticized the president for vetoing a Republican-led bill on restricting pension funds from making investment decisions based on climate change and other factors. Sign this veto because the legislation passed by the Congress would put at risk the retirement savings. The legislation is part of broader Republican efforts to combat policies they call too politically correct or woke. 
Daniel Monahan, NTD News. An American aircraft carrier is docked for a four-day visit in Manila, Philippines. The USS America just completed a joint exercise with the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. The nearly 850-foot-long assault carrier can accommodate more than 3,000 sailors and Marines. The commanding officer, Captain Shoki Snyder, said the visit is part of a normal spring patrol the ship conducts each year. He also spoke of a greater purpose to the visit. Any Navy, uh, any of the U.S. naval ships uh, are free to operate uh, anywhere in international waters. Um, And we do that so the, the waters can remain free for all countries to use. It's the first time the vessel has docked in Manila to rest and recuperate. It's scheduled to leave on Thursday. According to Snyder, no deployment with the armed forces of the Philippines is planned. Google has suspended Chinese shopping app Pinduoduo. A Google spokesperson said today that malware issues were found on the platform. The spokesperson added that the Google Play version of the app has been suspended over security concerns. Google Play Protect scans all of the apps on Android phones and works to prevent the installation of malicious apps. Google's move follows efforts by the U.S. government to increase its cyber defenses. That's amidst an increase in hacking and digital crime targeting the country. The White House recently named China and Russia as the biggest cybersecurity threats to the United States. Up next, a retired Navy SEAL who published a book to help everyone bring out the leader in themselves and become a high-performing human. Some valuable lessons he wants to share after the break. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. The Fixture Pioneer, CGN. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All-round integration of four systems. High precision, high durability, high quality. Two micrometer repetition accuracy. More than 80 patent certificates. ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need. CGM has it all. Pride of Taiwan, CGM. Welcome back. Everybody is battling something different. That's what, make, uh, that's what Mike Cirilli believes. He's a retired Navy SEAL and the CEO of Talent War Group. He wrote a book to help you develop yourself as a leader. And I asked him what the lessons are that he wants to share and why he wrote the book. When you think about it, when you make each person within an organization better, the collective group performs better. So the everyday warrior is very much an individual uh, framework for developing yourself as a leader and a high-performing human. And it's from the collective lessons I learned from watching warriors around me. None of my books are autobiographies. I serve next to, to some exceptional men and women who just epitomize the definition of warrior. And so from watching them, their best practices, their habits, the foundational blocks they they built to living high-performing, impactful lives, I put that in the, uh, the book. Mm. And... There's one thing that I want to um, know more about because you encourage people to embrace failure. Why is that? Yeah, you know, failure, when you think about it, the external factors of failure are what people most likely fear. Judgment. What will other people think? And, and that's that's just being a human uh, being. And, and I understand that. But failure at the end of the day is the refining fire by which we define success. You fail until you succeed. Anyone who's met some level of uh, excellence or, or prestige or, or achieve some goal will tell you they failed so many times in order to get to that point. Failure is life's greatest manner. So embrace it. Nobody has to like failure, but when you understand it's part of the process and that's how you truly learn and grow, then you use it to your benefit. And so within special operations, uh, you know, the training is designed to make somebody fail up front and to see how you react to failure. Will you keep getting back up? Can you learn, adjust, and then continue on? And that's ultimately why uh, it was a key chapter 
the first chapter in the book. Mm, that's really interesting. And do you have any, you know, maybe personal example? Because you have a interesting background. You've probably been in very intense situations. So is, is there a personal example that, that you can share and, you know, what you took away from it? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, you know, I, not to, to get too, uh, uh, you know, dark here, but uh, I was on a rooftop with a man named uh, Michael Monsor, who, uh, you know, was a Navy SEAL. He jumped on a grenade three feet from myself and two other SEALs to save us. And uh, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. He did, he did not live, but he saved our lives. Um, and from that, uh, you know, you go into a lot of reflection. And uh, that was my second deployment in the SEAL teams. And I went on to do a total of 11 deployments. And uh, I, it humbled me. Uh, I learned, I still learn from Mikey Monsor to this day. They just released a book, Defend Us in Battle on him. And even in his death, I still learned from him. But that, that, that experience taught me so much about, I don't know what I don't know, and I'm not as good as, uh, as I think. And so that humility that it provided me has become a, 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 a building block in my, uh, in my life. You know, consistency is key. And, you know, the, I, what I've come to, to, to learn about and, and identify, and I, and I write about it in the book, is that we all have outcomes or goals that we want to achieve, destinations. Rarely have I ever found true joy in achieving those goals or arriving at that destination. It's what you learn along the way, the journey, the foundational building blocks that you build going through hardship. If I were to give you everything in life, and it was easy, I would provide you with none of the principles necessary to live an impactful, fulfilling, and purpose-driven life. So you have to engage in hardship. Don't fear or don't refrain from accepting risk. And, and as, as we say in the, the special operations community, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because when one is pushed outside their mental and physical limits, that's where true learning and growth take place. But you've got to be consistent. Not every day is a step forward. It's a step to the side, maybe five steps back, but that's just part of the process that goes to failure. Once you choose your goal, stay with it. Stay with it. You'll be surprised uh, how little the goal ends up providing you in terms of value. But again, that journey and what you learn along the way and those alongside you provide so much uh, joy, uh, especially being part of a military unit. Uh, you know That is very much part of my DNA. We accomplish some amazing things, but the amazing part about it is the men and women that I was surrounded by. Wow, lots of profound things. Uh, thank you so much, yeah. Mike Cerulli. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. You know, Evelyn, those Navy SEALs are some tough people. So, you know, it makes sense that he would write a book on how to develop your leadership skills. No, yeah, I agree. And I, it, it, I'm pretty impressed at how self-reflected he is also. I really like the part where he said, you know, I think he said something to the um, point of, um, when you're afraid of, you're not necessarily afraid of the failure, it's the judgment you're afraid of. And I think that's a good point to always find the underlying root cause, basically. Wow. Yeah, yeah. he's really got the mental toughness down. Exactly. All right, uh, that's all for today's program. We're ending here, it here on that note. Uh, as usual, write us if you have any ideas for stories or feedback at goodmorning at ntd.com. That's, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.